So the first uh, story took place a year ago, and Terence and Rupert <coughs> were involved in no part of this story. <coughs> I was sitting in my office with my secretary, Nina, uh, about a year and a half ago. And there was a knock on the door. She said, well, this is a friend of a friend of mine who wants to interview you. But I was very busy with the telephone and the correspondence and stuff. So he came and sat, and I answered uh, his questions without thinking. Later on, a month or so passed, a photographer arrived, and I began to realize that I'd done something uh, significant. I'd given an interview for GQ magazine. I, I called my children, who know about such things, and asked them what was GQ magazine, and they, and they knew what it was, and follow and, and read it to some extent. They live in Hollywood. I was in Italy when the, uh, the magazine finally arrived on the stands. And of course, I had notified my children, my mother, and everybody. I was very proud that, in spite of my, my style of dress, that I had been <laughs> the first one in our circle to actually be photographed for GQ. <laughs> <laughs> but I was shocked in uh, Firenze to open the <clears throat> first page of the magazine and to see my picture uh, occupying a large part of the first page, the table of contents page, where the heading says, Abraham sells drugs to mathematicians. <laughs> <clears throat> and there were some other insulting things in the, in the interview that, as far as I could remember, was largely fiction um, that occurred later on in the magazine. So I didn't mention it to anybody. I came back to California, and I was very pleased that nobody mentioned it. Nobody had noticed. There were one or two phone calls, and I realized that nobody, after all, does read GQ. <laughs> and if they do look at the pictures, they somehow overlooked mine. So I squeaked by, and I was safe after all this dangerous pass being outed by GQ. <clears throat> Suddenly, my peace was disturbed once again by a hundred phone calls in a single day asking what did I think of the article about me in the San Francisco Examiner or the Chronicle or the San Jose Mercury and so on. After all, the embers in the fire left by GQ had flamed up again in the pen of a, a journalist. A woman who writes a computer column for the San Francisco Examiner had received in her mailbox a copy of this article in GQ in which uh, Timothy Leary is quoted as saying, the uh, Japanese go to Burma for teak and they go to California for novelty and creativity. And everybody knows that California has this resource thanks to psychedelics. And there again, it uh, quoted me as the supplier of a scientific renaissance in the 1960s. And <clears throat> this columnist, didn't believe what was asserted by Timothy Leary and others in the GQ article that the computer revolution and the computer graphic innovations of California had been built upon a psychedelic foundation. So she set out to prove that this story was false. She was about to go to SIGGRAPH, the largest gathering of computer graphic professionals in the world annually, somewhere in the United States, 30,000 or so people gather all of whom are vitally involved in the computer revolution. She thought she would set this heresy to rest by conducting a, a sample survey at SIGGRAPH a year ago in Las Vegas. She began her interviews at the airport the minute she stepped off the plane, and by the time she got back to her desk in San Francisco, had talked to 180 important professionals of the computer graphic field, all of whom answered yes to her question, do you take psychedelics, and is this important in your work? <laughs> so her column in the, uh, syndicated in all these newspapers finally said that, and again, unfortunately, or kindly, remembered me. Uh, shortly after this second accident in my story, I was in uh, Hollyhock, the Esalen of the Far North, with uh, Rupert and some others of you here. And I had a kind of psychotic break in the night. I couldn't sleep, and I was consumed with a paranoid fantasy about this uh, outage and what it would mean in my future career and the police at my door. 
and so on. And uh, I, I knew that my fears had uh, kind of blown up unnecessarily, but I needed someone to talk to. The person I knew best there was Rupert, and he was very busy uh, in council with uh, various friends, but eventually I, I took Rupert aside and I confided to him this uh, secret and all my fears and his response within a day or two was to repeat the story to everybody in Canada <laughs> <laughs> well assuring me that it's good to be outed and <laughs> and um, it would be good to come out and to come out maybe in a best-selling book, which Brockman, our agent, could sell and uh, a hawk for a huge uh, royalty advance and so on. I tried thinking positively um, <clears throat> about this episode, but um, when I came home, I still um, felt nervous about it, and I said no to many interviews from uh, ABC News and the United Nations and other people who called to check out this significant story. I did not rise to the occasion, and so uh, I've decided today, um, <clears throat> by popular request, to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> uh, this is um, perhaps uh, relevant to our theme for today, a different aspect of vision and our theme this morning of psychedelics and mathematical vision. So it all began in 1967 when I was a professor of mathematics at Princeton and one of my students turned me on to LSD. That led to my moving to California a year later and my meeting uh, at UC Santa Cruz a chemistry graduate student who is doing his PhD thesis on the synthesis of DMT. Uh, he and I smoked up a large bottle of DMT in 1969, and that resulted in a kind of secret resolve <clears throat> which uh, swerved my career to, an ex to, to a search for the connections between mathematics and the experience of the logos, or what Terence calls the transcendent other this hyperdimensional space full of meaning and wisdom and beauty which feels more real than ordinary reality and to which we have returned many times over the years for in instruction and pleasure and uh, in the course of the, f the next 20 years there were various steps I took to explore this connection between mathematics and the Logos. Uh, for example, I apprenticed myself to neurophysiologists and tried to construct brain models made out of the basic objects of chaos theory. Um, this was about the time that chaos theory was discovered by the scientific community and the chaos revolution began in 1973. I built a vibrating fluid machine to visualize uh, vibrations in transparent media because I felt on the basis of direct experience that the Hindu metaphor of vibrations was uh, an important one, a valuable one, and therefore that we could learn more about consciousness, communication, resonance, and the emergence of form and pattern in the physical, biological, social, and intellectual worlds through actually watching vibrations in transparent media ordinarily invisible and making them visible. I was inspired by Hans Janey, an amateur scientist in Switzerland, a follower of Rudolf Steiner, who had built an in ingenious gadget for rendering these transparent fluids visible. About this time, we discovered in Santa Cruz computer graphics, because the first affordable computer graphic terminals had appeared on the market, I started a project of teaching mathematics with computer graphics and eventually tried to simulate the mathematical models for neurophysiology and for vibrating fluids in computer programs with computer graphic displays. Uh, in this way evolved a new class of mathematical models called CDs, cellular dynamita. They are a really especially appropriate mathematical object for modeling or trying to understand the brain 
the mind, the visionary experience, and so on, as far as close anyway as mathematics could come to um, simulation of this experience. At the same time, other um, mathematicians, uh, some of whom may have been uh, recipients of my gifts in the 1960s, began their own experiments with computer graphics in different places and began to make films, which I used to show in annual uh, film clairvoyance of this evening later on in uh, many years later when I would be sitting in this theater watching a computer graphic film made by Tom Banchoff. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Eventually, we were able to construct machines in Santa Cruz which could simulate these kind of mathematical models that I call CDs at a reasonable speed, first slowly and then faster and faster. And in 1989, I had uh, a fantastic experience at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland where I was given access to, at uh, that time, the fastest supercomputer, the MPP, the Massively Parallel Processor. And my CD model for the visual cortex had been programmed into this machine by the only person able to, to program it, and I was invited to come and view the result. And looking at the color screen of this supercomputer was like looking through the window at the future and seeing uh, a, an excellent um, memory of a DMT vision not only proceeding a pace on the screen but also uh, going about a hundred times faster than a human experience and also under the control of knobs which I could turn at the terminal and so returning to my story now, and I'll quickly bring it to a close, there is, uh, first of all, a 20-year evolution from my uh, DMT year, 1969, to my MPP year, 1989. And following this 20-year uh, evolution and that uh, the recording of that video, we had uh, two things that I'll mention. One is the story with GQ and SIGGRAPH and the examiner that I've told you, which essentially poses the question then, has a psychedelic had an influence in the evolution of science, mathematics, the computer revolution, computer graphics, and so on. And the other event, in 1990, um, we got to see after, I think, the... Uh, publication of a paper on this in the International Journal of Bifurcation and Chaos, we saw an interesting article in the monthly notices of the American Mathematical Society, the largest union of uh, research mathematicians in the world, which amazingly redefined mathematics, dropping number and geometrical spaces as relics of history and adopting a new definition of mathematics as the study of space-time pattern. So this is not written by me. This is just in the pages of, uh, of science and the monthly notices of the American Mathematical Society. So we have to admit that uh, mathematics has been reborn, and this um, rebirth is some kind of outcome, of, apparently, of the computer revolution and the psychedelic revolution which took place concurrently, concomitantly, cooperatively in the 1960s. And uh, I might mention a, a, a current event on this horizon, uh, redefining this material as an art medium. I'm going to be able to give a, a concert of this material played in real time with a genuine supercomputer in October in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, the largest Gothic cathedral in the world. Well then, let's come to our subject. And I don't know if you gentlemen need to move up a little bit so that we can uh, trialogue. Now I have to do, uh, since I took so much time on a personal odyssey, I have to do to induce uh, trialogue in one minute. And uh, so this shortcut, what I want to do is um, just pose uh, one or two questions and read one or two excerpts from some favorite books here. 
so we have to accept uh, now, I think, mathematics either in the new definition or the old one. In the Renaissance cosmology of John Dee, mathematics is seen as the joint therapist of Father Sky and Mother Earth, or a kind of an intellectual, spiritual, elastic medium uh, connecting up the heavenly realms and Gaia herself. Uh, that puts mathematics then in, uh, on the same level as the Logos, the Holy Spirit. So let's just consider that for the sake of, of discussion. And um, having seen it as a language of space-time pattern, let me ask you this, uh, Terence and Roop. Um, to what extent could the psychedelic vision of the Logos be externalized? Could it be externalized by any means, either by verbal descriptions, or by computer simulations, by drawing of really inspired visionary artists? Or on the other hand, in what ways could possibly mathematical vision serve the spirit and extend the mind? Is there a role, in other words, for this kind of thing in our main concerns? <coughs> and uh, <coughs> to give you a fast forward into the answer, let me just read a couple of things here from uh, the Fruit of the Gods. Oh, <laughs> and uh, Terence's confessional chapter, chapter 15, a section called Art and the Revolution. He says, The archaic revival is a clarion call to recover our birthright. However uncomfortable that may make us, it is a call to realize that life lived in the absence of the psychedelic experience upon which primordial shamanism is based is life trivialized, life denied, life enslaved to the ego and its fear of disillusion in the mysterious matrix of feeling that is all around us. It is in the archaic revival that our transcendence of the historical dilemma actually lies. There is something more. It is now clear that new developments in many areas, including mind-machine interfacing, pharmacology of the synthetic variety and data storage imaging and retrieval techniques it is now clear that new developments in these areas are coalescing into the potential for a truly demonic or an angelic self-imaging of our culture do you remember I don't know, I don't know if you've tapped into chapter 15 Luke <clears throat> uh, here's another one then in uh, the rebirth of nature the final paragraph of the entire book entitled A New Renaissance uh, Rupert says as soon as we allow ourselves to think of the world as alive we recognize that a part of us knew this all along it is like emerging from winter into spring we can begin to reconnect our mental life with our own direct intuitive experiences of nature we can participate in the spirits of sacred places and times we can see that we have much to learn from traditional societies who have never lost their sense of connection with the living world around them we can acknowledge the animistic traditions of our ancestors and we can begin to develop a richer understanding of human nature shaped by tradition and collective memory linked to the earth and the heavens related to all forms of life and consciously open to the creative power expressed in all evolution we are reborn into a living world I call down then the trialogue mode <laughs> Psychedelics and, and mathematical vision. Well, the question that you posed in all of that, the nuts and bolts question, is can it be visualized with technologies ranging from paint and brush to supercomputers? I think it can. I think in, it is not, in principle, mysterious that it's uh, a domain 
to be explored, it may be fleeting, like the situation that follows upon the splitting of the atom or something like that. It may be remote, but it is in principle describable. And it's simply a matter of uh, paying attention, gaining inspiration, and gaining skill of technical execution. I think you think that, don't you? Well, I think that uh, any models that we can build, verbal, visual, or mathematical, are really, really feeble compared to the experience itself. <clears throat> On the other hand, this experience is within all, and without all, and we are immersed in in this spiritual world, world. So the tiniest resonance from the most feeble model may suffice to excite, as poetry excites emotion, to excite spirit. Uh, and this is the essence of communication, is to have a compact representation. So the experience is infinitely complex. And the representations have to be really simple. But the verbal a representation restricted to verbal mode alone might be too feeble, not similar enough to excite by resonance uh, the similar state. I mean, we have the situation where we agree that <clears throat> not every person is going to become a cephalopod. Not every person has the time to become a shaman. That we need a certain number of shamans in our culture to help to reconnect uh, human society and the planet and the sky. So we need some kind of amplifying and communicating device between the few people who are our real shamans, let's say sacred artists of the future, and the mass society watching MTV. And uh, so the question is, can these means be of use to the clarion, clarion call that you've given in your book. Yeah, I mean, I think that what makes it confusing is when you go into these domains, the encounter is an emotionally powerful one. And, and the situation is so novel that the experience tends to assume that this emotional power is coming from the input. It's not. It's coming from the encounter with the input. I mean, it's like posing the question, can you make a, a stirring record of the Grand Canyon? Yes, you can with uh, helicopter-mounted cameras and this sort of thing. But the emotion you have watching that, you bring to it. So the psychedelic dimension is objective, but it's also so awesome and, and so different from what we know that it encourages and promotes and triggers awe in us. And so we bring something to it which we can never image or, uh, or reduce to a, a verbal description or a piece of film. But in principle, I think the thing itself is just more of reality. It's like the heart of the cell, the radar maps of the Venusian surface, the center of the atom. I mean, these are real but this places. kind of reality, we don't need more of this. We've already got so much. No, we need more of, our, of this mental um, logos world. It's the logos world that we've lost the connection with. And so these computer programs, psychedelic drugs, dynamic modeling schemes are the equivalent of probes like Voyager. Uh, they're, but they're sent not to an alien planet, but to an alien phase space of some sort, but one that we need connection to. Hmm. I, I agree with Terence. The problem is one of the the emotional intensity of a psychedelic experience is totally different from seeing the computer graphic display of the kind we saw. And <clears throat> it's possible to get something a bit like that just by shaking a kaleidoscope and looking into it. 
and in these expensive novelty shops that dot California um, one can find fancy kaleidoscopes beautifully made and people buy them I suppose and, and you look through them and within a few seconds you're just bored nobody ever really looks at them for very long you can see a dazzling series of displays of pattern and colour but somehow they have no meaning and don't engage one and I think the, the the difference between a representation of the state and being in the state itself is this sense of meaning, engagement and intensity. And that, I think, is the problem because I don't think it's just the graphic representation. I think it's that meaning and intensity that we can find in many areas. I, for one, being a botanist, um, am very drawn to flowers. I love looking at flowers. And sometimes you can look at a whole garden full of flowers, like here in Esalen, and it's quite meaningless. At other times, you can look at a single flower for a long time, you can go into it, it's like a mandala, you enter into this realm, and it takes on incredible meaning, beauty, and significance. And the realm of flowers is one that's explored these mandala-type, almost psychedelic spaces, if you like. And one can sometimes enter into it, and sometimes one doesn't. The same with butterflies, and many other uh, natural creations. So it seems to me the problem is how to enter into that engagement, intensity and sense of meaning rather than representation of the pattern itself because there's plenty of patterns around in the natural world. No, but these are space-time patterns and whereas we can say the words space-time pattern we nevertheless have no language for individual space-time patterns mm -hmm. within space-time pattern as experienced by us, as, as perceived by us, there is a kind of a resonance between different patterns that we see, let us say the um, bobbing uh, kelp forests in the, in the ocean out here, that somehow makes uh, different elements of that space-time pattern make a resonance with different space-time patterns of neurotransmitters in the visual cortex or something. So some aspects are perceived and other aspects are, are not. They remain invisible to us. And yet we don't have any language for what we perceive. So we can't, as uh, Rupert suggested, have data storage and retrieval on this level. We don't have language for that. You've been, say, speaking of the flowers in the garden or the images in the kaleidoscope. These are static patterns. We have an extensive verbal language for that. So what I'm suggesting is an expansion of our visual linguistic capability in the direction of a universal language for space-time patterns such that we could then speak of our experience. We could remember space-time pattern experiences, call them by name. We could mention to each other the mere drop of a word or a code, an I-75, or Highway 1, Highway 0, and then we would uh, be transmitting a huge image of a space-time pattern along with whatever emotion you remember from the time when you experienced that, awakening this mm. in the mind of the listener and therefore able to converse, intellectualize, understand and reconnect with the space-time pattern of and feeling of the spiritual world. I mean, uh, let's, let's face it, we have had the most extensive experience of this world through visual metaphors of, well, movies. We experience the logos as movies. We don't experience this at, at words, although there are sounds and there are words pop up from and sometimes there's writing on the wall like graffiti. Basically, it's an infinite uh, field of consciousness, of uh, vibration, of uh, waves moving, of intelligence which may be disconnected in different parts <clears throat> and when we travel in this realm we go somewhere we've been before and we recognize it and that excites in us memory which is reinforced which is extended upon which we can do further experiment because we do remember that somehow a mental faculty individually and within it has data storage and retrieval and it has a language or something and yet we can't share it even let us just say us three we've had our 
uh, many experiences which I trust, I have great faith, are similar, mm -hmm. that are universal experience, and yet we are absolutely speechless in verbalizing them to each other so we could see whether we had or didn't have any similarity in this certain, um, I'm sorry, words fail me. Well, I don't know. It seems to me that art or, or that mind responds, it has an affinity for itself. And if it's universal, then it has an affinity for the universal mind. What's interesting about the example of the kaleidoscope is it's boring after a few minutes. We all agree on that. If you analyze how it works it, and take it apart, the base uh, units in most kaleidoscopes are pieces of broken glass, pebbles, things like this detritus junk and and somehow uh, splitting this into six sections with a mirror and putting it in heavy oil is supposed to bring you to the realm of something watchable and interesting but it isn't the brain machines being produced in germany are the same way all patterns seems to be to quickly lose its charm unless it's pattern that has been put through the sieve of minds, any mind, so that when, uh, so that we enjoy looking at ruins and uh, the artifacts of vanished civilizations uh, a lot more than random arrangements of natural objects. So it seems to me what we're looking for when we say it's like a DMT trip, the the MPPI data on chaos, then what we're saying is, aha, here in this pattern there is the footstep, of the footprint of meaning. It's as though an architect passed through here and so we can appreciate it. So we're always looking for the betraying presence of an order that is more than an order of, I don't know even how to say it, economy, I guess. We look for an aesthetic order, and when we find that, then we have this reciprocal sense of recognition and transcendence, and this is what uh, the psychedelic experience provides in spades. Now, a critic of the psychedelic experience would object, of course it's made of mind, it's made of your mind. Uh, but for the psychedelic voyager, this does not seem to be obvious. The intuition is it is made of mind, but it is not made of my mind. So then either there's an identity problem or uh, a real frontier of communication is being crossed. But I think when we say we look for living pattern or aesthetically satisfying order, what we really mean is we look for the sign that mind has somehow touched the stochastic processes of, uh, of nature. Yes, but still the limiting factor seems to be neither the richness of display we find in nature, nor even the language that we can communicate with, but rather mm. the ability to go into something with intensity of vision. Because I don't think language is a limiting problem. I mean, for example, music can be written down in a language. You can get a score of Beethoven's symphonies or Mozart piano concertos. I mean, I can read music, but for me, it doesn't come to life from this language. I have to hear it for it to come to life. The language is indeed a kind of communication, but it has to come to life. Presumably, mathematical notation is a form of notating things in the mathematical landscape which mathematicians can see. And take the realm of plants again. If you look at the incredible richness of botany, of flower forms, this is, or there is a language for this, it's used by botanists in floras. You've got books, you know, about the, there are words for these different kinds of flowers. And for a botanist, the whole thing can be written down in the specialized language. But even so, it doesn't mean that um, uh, most botanists spend most of their time contemplating the beauty of flowers. They're sort of rushing to the next committee meeting or getting their paper ready for the next public journal or something <laughs> that somehow there isn't much time spent in actually entering into these realms uh, even for people whose profession it is to be concerned with them so we're neither short of images 
nor of languages in many realms, but rather of the time, the space, and the um, inclination to enter into these realms, to be within them. Well, this is a good metaphor, I think, the musical metaphor. Let's just think of this for a minute. I don't propose that a mathematical model <coughs> of a, a brain or a plant or something would be as wonderful as a bla- brain or, or a plant. Life will not be replaced by language. We never demand that much of ordinary language or poetry or of the graphic arts. Nevertheless, the evolution of music has been greatly aided by musical notation. Because we wouldn't like music to end and simply be left with a library of musical scores. Nevertheless, the evolution of music, the evolution of culture has been enormously facilitated by having a graphic language that can, to some extent, recall the actual musical experience. And this is the role that I'm proposing for mathematics, not to replace the earth or the heavenly realms, but just somehow to facilitate the traffic through, um, let us say, simply an analog on the same level of musical staff notation that pertains to the visual experience of space-time patterns, whether of a flowering garden or the waving sea or the psychedelic vision. Maybe I need to tell you of last week in Denmark. I intended a a conference about uh, chaos theory and its applications, and I showed this video. There was in the audience uh, another speaker who is the world expert on algorithmic information theory. This is a way of telling the difference between chaos and randomness. And um, as Terence was saying, there is in verbal representation a kind of economy, that there's a simple formula that calls forth a complex experience. And this economy is the reason that language is, is interesting. Algorithmic information theory gives a way of measuring randomness, and what seems to us as random sometimes can be generated by a very small code or a musical staff notation, for example. And when uh, data from a scientific experiment looks random, one can try to test it uh, as to whether there is or isn't a, a compact economical model for it. And if there is, it's more chaotic and less random. So there's a measure for this. And a a truly, according to their definition, a truly random process, which would provide data which could not be represented by any formula shorter than itself. (laughs) But it turns out that the the weirdest, most random-looking data from the natural world, for example, earthquakes, sunspots, and so on, always uh, seems to have a very compact mathematical model. Therefore, it's not truly random, it only looks random, and this is what is called deep data. So what I'm suggesting is an increase in our uh, encyclopedia of models, extending language, so that we can name store, retrieve, and recreate, not the experience itself, but the data of it, as it were, for the sake of communication with something which is very small, so that many of these models can be put in the closet. And this is exactly what musical staff notation did for for music. It pertains not only to the spiritual experience, but also to uh, fundamental questions on the future of human societies, environmental problems. Can we understand the space-time nature of the planet well enough, uh, since it's so complex, to even be sensitive to it and cooperate with it. I mean, if we can't even understand what we're seeing when we look at, at the planet, then there's not much we can do to cooperate. Biogeography, for mm-hmm. example, is a botanical field that could be revolutionized by a staff notation for space-time pattern, which it doesn't have. But surely what we're looking for is meaning that seems to us somehow full of significance. I mean, in terms of information, even patterns, we've got libraries full. Uh, You go into any bookshop and you're just overwhelmed by the quantity of stuff there. And the idea of just having more, 
even more models on the shelf, even more, somehow doesn't seem very exciting to me. I mean, what would be exciting would be to see some deep meaning in all of this. And maybe mathematics is one way to find the, the deep meaning in things. Um, but if so, I'm not quite sure how. Well, the taxonomy of plants is not full of meaning, and nevertheless, vocabulary has vo evolved, so the exfoliate and the, all these mm. words are are put on a page and then another botanist can read this and actually tell well yes this is the plant therefore it's safe to eat it and have an experience mm -hmm. so um, I think a further development in evolution from the stage of having language may be the generation of meaning I mean meaning is not given in the data we have to grok things we have to uh, struggle and evolve understanding by some hermeneutical process mm -hmm. so um, well, our, our language, as people said when uh, printing began, that would be the end of memory. When writing began, that would be the, the end of history. Well, in both cases, they were correct. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but when language began, we actually, that's when we lost our connection with the natural world. Well, well maybe, maybe it was language. a kind of language, yeah. I mean, Spoken language. Mm, maybe language processed acoustically, that it's not in the generation of it that you want to put your attention, but in the reception and decoding of it. That when language became something acoustically processed, it became so bloodless that it became then the willing servant of abstraction, which before had been an exotic and little explored branch of linguistic activity that suddenly burgeoned into the major concern of a lot of people, that um, language processed visually is here and now stuff of great density. And acoustical language permits a level of abstraction that is creates a higher inclusiveness but a necess that's achieved by a necessary dropping out of detail I'm glad to hear you say so since it always sounds that you think the logos itself is speech but I'm I must say I'm beheld. astonished at the resistance I'm getting here to the idea of visual language I think that well when I travel in uh, France, I'm riding in the train or something, and I'm really bothered by all the gossip going around because I understand French, and then I realize this couple is having trouble, and the, the train is not stopping in the station that I expected, and so on. When I travel in Japan, I don't understand anything, so it seems to me it's really silent there. It's very quiet. I just don't hear anything. <laughs> and where we have uh, an oral language uh, for a certain phenomena, we then perceive it it is moved by a moving truck. This moving van comes along and transports this stuff from the unconscious system to the conscious system. Then we deal with it in a different way. And these uh, visions, space-time patterns, which we can't recognize, for which we have no visual language, they are essentially unconscious to us. So therefore, we can't interact with them. And this might be a fundamental reason that the uh, planet is dying. Either we shouldn't have verbal language or we should have verbal language and visual language as well. I'm not sure which. But since verbal language is so poorly adapted to space-time patterns, I mean, we don't describe music in verbal language. We have staff notation, a visual language for music. And, and uh, I think that our intellectual relationship to the sky and to the earth would be vastly improved by um, <clears throat> developing a, a, a larger closet of models for visual processes. But I, I can't mm -hmm. get you to, to agree to this. No, I agree. So, I agree. I think you're right that seeing language, I, I regard language as some kind of project that is uncompleted as we sit here, that it isn't the transfer of thought and intention into speech. That doesn't do it. I mean, clearly, you know, the whole world is held together by small mouth noises, and it's only <laughs> barely held together by small mouth noises. If we could uh, have a tighter network of communication, we would, in a sense, be a less diffuse species. Communication, the lack of it, 
is what's shoving us over the brink if you buy in to the idea that psychedelics somehow are showing you the evolutionary path yet to be followed then it seems obvious that what it entails is a further completion of the project of language maybe what all this technology is about is actually a more explicit condensation of the word I mean it is interesting that modernity is characterized by uh, an ever more explicit evocation of the image I mean you just have to go back a hundred years and the best anything could do is an albumen tint photograph now we have you know color lithography HD TV high speed printing uh, uh, virtual reality it's as though you know language is becoming uh, the word is becoming flesh and condensing into the visual realm would make it tr would be almost a kind of telepathy compared to the kind of linguistic reality we're living in now I mean glad to hear it yeah no no yeah. argument on that <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, what we may be doing is returning after a detour of centuries into the realm of literacy. You see, I think it's interesting that in most of human history, and still today, for, for more than half the people alive on this planet, uh, the, the literacy is not the big thing about language. It's spoken language. Most cultures are originally oral cultures. Still, the majority of people can't read and write. If you can't read and write, it means that the visual cortex in the left hemisphere of your brain has not been hijacked by the speech centers. As soon as you learn to read and write, the visual part of the left-hand side of the brain gets taken over by the speech centers, which are to do with sound and the processing of sound, and becomes adapted to reading and writing letters, language. And this knocks out one half or a large part of half of one's brain's visual processing capacity it gets into the habit of dealing with linear print now you're afraid I'm going to knock out the other half <laughs> <laughs> well I think that this, this I think that the, the uh, as far as I know there's been very few studies of the difference in thought patterns between people who can't read and write and those who can and I'm not now talking about people in our, in our society who can't read and write because they're dyslexic or have dropped out of school, but whole cultures, like um, many traditional cultures, where nobody reads and writes, or very few do. Um, there, language has a different role. It, in, in India, when I lived there, I found for illiterate people, there was an extremely power, lang language is a very powerful medium, and it conjures up metas metaphors, images, in a quite different way than it does for people who are literate um, so uh, uh, you yourself are complaining that you find new generations of students at Santa Cruz uh, can't read or write anymore um, and it may be that this process of short circuiting out literacy uh, is already well advanced uh, and that a new kind of visual language is developing but, but it, I think that there's been actually a huge amount of discussion about this difference between so-called print linear cultures and oral aboriginal cultures. This is what McLuhan's whole work was about and saying that somehow the symbolic signification of language, first through writing and then through printing, um, has created, um, has had all kinds of effects on the evolution of the Western mind that we, until McLuhan, were totally unaware of. I mean, he believes that the linear, uniform quality of print creates the intellectual preconditions for the acceptance of an idea like democracy that you would never get that notion. The Greeks invented it. They had a phonetic alphabet. Uh, uh, modern industrial methods of production based on interchangeable parts. He felt that was inconceivable except by a print culture that had the notion of movable type. Uh, the idea of the citizen 
is a uniformitarian impulse laid over the biological diversity of our individuality that could never have occurred in a culture without print. So the, the bottom line in the McLuhanist analysis is that uh, we tend to be incredibly naive about the information processing technologies we put in place because all we care about is input and output and what we don't understand is it's the plumbing that this between the input and the output that gives a culture its whole tone, its values, its implicit political assumptions, its attitude toward nature, so forth and so on, and that what we are is a print culture, you know, linear, hierarchical. Were. What we were. What we were, yes. We're undergoing a transition in the 20th century. But the intellectuals, unfortunately, at the top of the pyramid are the last to get the news. I mean, they're still poring over Locke and Hegel when, you know, what's really happening is guns and roses and nirvana. And I don't mean the Buddhist state of transcendence. Uh, so culture tends to be ruled by the people who are uh, the last to get the news in terms of new technologies which are reshaping the culture. Like, I think all this <coughs> beefing about the death of literacy you might as well beef about the passing of the high button shoe or the beaver hat. I mean, literacy is finished. It's, it was a phase. It's not to be preserved by anyone other than curators. The rest of us are going to live, obviously, in a, in a culture shaped by new forms of media. We haven't given up reading and writing books ourselves, have we? Um, well, I think we're reactionaries. <laughs> it's true. It's the drugs we extol that get us called modern, not or postmodern. Well, we'd like to uh, abandon books and only make documentary videos for PBS and BBC. It but pays so it much doesn't better. Work. It doesn't pay. It can't uh, s support the process. So that's uh, at best for some time in the future. Meanwhile, the, the, the reason that I complain that my students are illiterate is that history is unavailable to them. There's no way to tap, tap into it. All these fantastic books on the Middle Ages, the prehistoric, the archaeology, and so on, this stuff is never going to be translated into documentary videos. It's not enough to just have a few curators who are in touch with the Library of Congress and the British Museum. Um, I think that w we need a large number of people who read as a hobby or something. Meanwhile... But don't you think, Ralph, that that's actually a kind of amnesia? It's not that they're illiterate. Illiterate is when you don't know the difference between Melville and Hawthorne. Amnesia is when you don't know whether the Thirty Years' War came before or after the War of the Roses. Well, if you're literate and you forgot, you could look it up in the Encyclopedia Britannica. You could <laughs> dial it up in a hypercard. I mean, there's going to be a CD-ROM for it. In fact, I think you're the manufacturer. True, true. Yes. So... <clears throat> These uh, historical media, let us say, they don't lose their importance just because new media are developed. Now, there's a further problem, which you touch on extensively in your book, which uh, relates television as a drug. Mm -hmm. And I think this is interesting that we had, you know, we had botanical drugs, then we have chemical drugs, now we have electronic drugs. What's coming next? So the fact is that my students have watched television nine, uh, seven hours a day, six and a half according to your book, since birth. And they are unbelievably quick with images, and it's great because this is a fantastic advance in intelligence, in human intelligence. And the way that information can be communicated in 25 seconds by the best of the television commercials, I think, is truly astonishing. 
and not everybody, you can't show these commercials in the African bush or something and get a response. You have to have people who have been trained up to it by doing their visual calisthenics six and a half hours a day since birth. <laughs> so that's good. What's not so good is that the material is available in the video store or from the Library of Congress after we get FDDI and so on. This material is unbelievably poor. And the fact is that if you make a PBS documentary on Food of the Gods, for example, nobody will watch it because they're busy watching Dynasty or I don't even know the names of them. <laughs> and that somehow the drug abuse aspect of the new media is, uh, has already dominated its future. So that this creote is already so deep that it's unlikely we can swerve um, the video technology into an, an interesting cultural resource. Well, that is my problem with, the, with your approach, actually. Mm. The, the, um, these computer graphics use basically television-style technologies. No, the computer graphics, you see, are going to be... We're only five years away from having supercomputers like that. That was made on a 200 megaflop machine, which cost $13 million <coughs> three years ago. And today you can buy them for $500,000. We're using a $500,000 one will be delivered to the Cathedral of St. John Divine in five years. That will be in the kitchen keeping track of your recipes and running your microwave. Mm -hmm. So uh, the possibility is to interact with this. You see, it already becomes almost as interesting as a psychedelic trip as long as you can interact. What's wrong with this passive medium is it's dead and some idiot programmed it and made it available and then it was distributed as a, a drug and people are, are actually addicted to the passive process of, of sitting there and knocked out and just like receiving somebody else's fantasy. So I think that when um, these uh, supercomputers are available in kitchens and kindergarten playrooms and people are brought up on, this is an extension of life. This is an increase in the size of the playroom. The thing is, you can't yes. underestimate the perversity of people in terms of their tendency to prefer this passive thing. I remember in 1977 when I bought my first home computer, you got a manual with it called Basic Basic. <laughs> and the intent of this manual was to teach you how to program your computer. Well, six months of trying to peddle that to the American public, and they realized they had to completely rethink the product, that only a vanishingly small number of people were ever going to program a computer. It's like when you used to buy an automobile and you got a toolbox with it. Well, that's not been true since the 20s. So there's a certain responsibility on the consumer uh, not to demand the prepackaged uh, the prepackaged stuff. It's the MTPI. These big machines are, to my mind, like the psychedelic drug state. But then everybody's trip is like the software they bring to it and run. And someone who goes to the MPPI machine to keep track of their recipes is essentially trivializing it because they don't know what it could do. This is probably the equivalent of going to a psychedelic drug to solve your relationship problems. It's that the question you framed was so stupid and mini-minded and perhaps the drug, the psychedelic can help, but what a tremendous misappropriation of its Well, every power. tool will be misused as well as used, will be misused more than it's used. And the most popular books are cookbooks, and nevertheless, we write books. And <clears throat> to some little extent, they participate in the evolution of history. The fact that most books are used for recipes doesn't uh, totally destroy all value of books. And so it is with the new media, whereas most people will use them to uh, hypercard stack of recipes or sex postures or something, there will still be a lot of arcane and important available uh, material available in this medium which can't be accessed any other way. 
Nevertheless, I must say, you're, you're kind of dragging me down here. Maybe it's time I need some help from this group. Uh, I became very depressed this year when I realized that not only my students couldn't read or write, but also that their interest in computers was much less than the preceding generation a year ago, which was much less. For the last three or four years, interest in computers has been on the decline. So along with the television medium, the interactive capability, I mean, you're right about the tool kit that comes with the car and basic and so on, not even to use uh, tools like Adobe Illustrator or HyperCard or or even McWright or any, not to use any of those tools, be only interested in computer games. Here's the most brilliant kids in high school are doing nothing but play Tetron Game Boy. Just think that over. I have my colleague, brilliant professors of mathematics from China who do nothing but after work, they play Tetron Game Boy. Think it over. But I'm ten impressed. years ago, it would have been heroin. Now it's just Game Boy. What do you mean, just Game Boy? It's much more dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't been made illegal yet. True, they can just do it unto death. <laughs> but I, I mean, just one final point I want to make. It's a, the, the model you're suggesting takes us further into the artificial world, the man-made world of technology. And the, we've still got this incredible resource, five million species of beetles in the Amazon. I mean, incredible diversity of the natural world that hardly anyone's interested in any, anymore. There are these herbarium collections, there are uh, it's all these different plant butterfly collections, geological museums with rocks and crystals of every kind. Go into them in London or Prague or anywhere, they're completely deserted. That there's an incredible diversity of form in the natural world. Um, and we become more and more plugged into the entirely human world of technologies and man-made patterns, models, and so on. I mean, how does this relate towards, um, how could it help in a greater sense of connection with the living yes. world? Well, this will be maybe a good place to stop. I believe that our connection to the natural world will be enormously enhanced by the new media. And this is in spite of the fact <coughs> that most people will relate to it as a new form of drug. Uh, I, I don't feel personally responsible for the habits of the human species. I think that uh, planetaria, for example, which are artificial models of the sky, which are um, brighter and simpler and easier to understand, especially along with special programs that show only certain motions at one time, that the planetaria have an enormous potential to turn people on to the real sky, which after all is the, is the ultimate source of our mind, our intellect, our mathematics and language and, and so on. So although the construction of planetaria in big cities around the world is an expansion of the synthetic world at the expense of the natural. The, the whole idea of it is to um, try to turn a switch in some few people that makes them aware of what was there all the time. And I think a hypercard stack with uh, high speed, high quality color pictures and sound um, giving all the beetles in the Amazon jungle would enormously help me personally to understand what I'm seeing when I go there. So, uh, nevertheless, nobody goes to planetaria. Nobody accesses these. A few school children will go once and nobody will really be affected by them. So somehow the habits of society are such that we can't um, make good use what could be critical good use of technology. And uh, in the meanwhile, there are these elements that amplify infinitely the bad uses for some kind of uh, piracy, I guess. But, but I'd like to defend Ralph to you, Roop. I don't think that it's really a journey deeper into artificiality. I mean, science has been dependent on instrumentality for a long, long time. The natural world that Ralph's program would reveal 
is the natural world of syntax that in other words language would become a much more accessible object for study if it were visually explicit and I expect that this is happening I, uh, so it seems to me it's just a new frontier in natural history it's this most complex and least understood of all behaviors which is language and while the instrumentalities may be computers high-speed imaging and so forth it's no more than using the Hubble telescope or something like that to to tease data out of a very distant part of the universe and then make it explicit and if we could understand language we would understand something about our own uh, place in nature that eludes us because it's clearly the most complex thing we do and we're the most complex thing we know and the feedback from it is culture the most anomalous phenomenon in the natural world so I think it's pretty exciting to use these things to try and understand I mean people say spirit cognition consciousness but ultimately just language is is what should come out of this a much deeper understanding of language mm -hmm. well it's the time is this okay yes mm -hmm. yeah let's throw uh, it time open. time to uh, o open up for uh, our interaction on the larger scale customarily we the uh, whoever does the induction also summarizes or concludes I, I, I don't feel I have the wherewithal to really conclude this I would like to um, just end our trialogue with uh, a kind of emotional reaction to the synthesis of, of all this uh, what I see as <laughs> negative feedback to <laughs> not only my <laughs> idea this morning but also my life work. I'm going to, to to say that I um, th this was kind of a strategy that uh, uh, backfired. I chose to uh, uh, out of uh, fr from an initial statement where I put mathematics on a fairly high pedestal there as the um, the marriage counselor of Father Sky and Mother Earth. I uh, then, for the sake of discussion with uh, these guys for our own group mind, I scaled down the image of mathematics to an extension of language, a kind of language, a visual language, and so on, because we have to actually discuss mathematics here without really knowing what it is. It's a study of space-time pattern or something. I just want to end by saying this, that mathematics is part of the natural world. It is not an extension, it's just part of the natural world. Mathematics is a landscape which can be explored as simply and directly and with much incredible uh, pleasure, delight, and advancement as the psychedelic logos or any other aspect of the intellect. The mathematical landscape does not belong to the human species. It belongs uh, not to the earth but to the sky it's part of the infinite universe we we live in and whatever microscopes telescopes chaoscopes and computer graphic tools we can devise to enhance our vision of the mathematical universe is uh, definitely advantageous how that this will fit into society however we admit that we are in a problem. Uh, we are in a cultural problem. We are in an evolutionary challenge from which the human species may not survive. Part of our difficulty is the rejection, I mean, this is perhaps a small part, but uh, mathematics is essential in the marriage of Father Sky and Mother Earth, and our culture has totally rejected mathematics. Uh, so it's possible that that's part of the problem and uh, that's what kind of what I've given my life work to as it were so the uh, answer to the question on the psychedelic and the mathematical vision 
um, is that there is a relationship and is kind of abstract because we're stymied, I guess, uh, uh, to summarize our discussion by bad habits of the human species at the present time. So I'll leave it there.